Thanks, David. I'm actually going to um, go back on what you just said. I'm not an expert in the SDGs or sustainability. Um, I am just a structure engineer who wants to do good things with his work. Um, and so when I was asked to speak to the board and the council in July about this topic, um, obviously I was very happy to do so and thought it sounded like a great idea, but then immediately started to panic when I realised how little I actually knew about this. Um, so I spent the preceding weeks making a complete nuisance of myself around the Office of Arup, chasing up all people who did know lots of things about the SDGs and about sustainability, and try to sort of pull things together into a 30-minute nutshell of what I think we can, we can do better. Um, and hopefully, this will give you a bit of that tonight. Um, people who are sat right at the back, if you can't see my beard well enough from there, there's actually quite a lot of chairs down here at the front. So if anyone does want to move, please feel free. Um, so, uh, yeah, tonight I'm going to give a brief overview of what the SDGs are um, in a way that hopefully will help those of you who don't recognise them understand them. Um, talk about their relationship to the climate emergency that's, you know, a pretty hot topic at the moment, excuse the pun, and give some examples of how we might change the way we work uh, to have an impact both globally and locally that aligns with the SDGs. So let's start by looking at the SDGs themselves. These are really important. This is a global view of what a better world looks like. Um, about 5 million people contributed to writing the UN SDGs, and every country in the world has signed up to them. Um, each of those 17 goals that you just saw, and we'll come back to them, is split into a number of targets. There is, on average, about 10 targets per goal. I think there's 169 or something in total. Um, and they're typically very ambitious, um, and most of them are quantifiable. So you can see from target 1.1, uh, target 1.1 is to eradicate extreme poverty from the world in its entirety by the year 2030. Um, and all of these targets have the year 2030 as a cut-off deadline. So that's only 10 years away from now. I don't expect many of us or any of us will have been retired by that point, so these are pretty relevant to us. Um, I'm not going to go into targets and indicators tonight, which is how the targets are tracked, but I just thought I'd put this up to help you understand more about the SDGs. Um, these indicators have been sort of assembled to help us see how we're getting on, basically. Um, so for each goal, there's a bunch of targets, and for each target, there's a bunch of indicators. And if we look at the indicators, we know how we're getting on. Um, this website's quite good if you're interested to see how people are doing. Um, I'm going to put a list of all the web links and stuff up at the very end of this, so you don't have to worry too much if you miss them. Um, this website, dashboards.sgindex, uh, takes data from sources like the World Bank, um, UNICEF, WHO, and it compares that data to these indicators to try and work out how countries are getting on. Um, green means that a country is on track to meet the, the particular goal that you've clicked on by the year 2030. And so it might come as little surprise to see that most of this so-called developed world is um, painted quite red in terms of responsible consumption. But um, I'll leave that to you to think about. Um, this app is also quite good, uh, SDGs in Action. Um, this exists on Apple and Android and gives lots of like, you know, snippets of information about each of the different goals and targets. Quite a good thing to get on your phone the night before you're giving a talk at the iStruct for example, and you want to brush up on some facts. Um, so, back to the 17 goals themselves. The first thing that's worth knowing is that all 17 goals are kind of written they just exist for this one goal in the top left-hand corner, SDG 1. Um, so the SDGs were written basically to eradicate poverty, and they all feed back to that. Um, and the point is that you can't eradicate poverty uh, without solving ongoing food crises um, and without ensuring that cities are resilient to the effects of climate change. It also acknowledges that the goals are interrelated to each other, so they go beyond this. Um, and to give you a couple of examples, um, in order to end poverty, we need to ensure decent work for people. But we can't do that if we don't reduce inequalities. Um, and one of the ways in which you can reduce inequalities is to end poverty. So you see this sort of rather confusing cycle happens. Um, something a bit more firmly rooted in the built environment. Um, if we want to end poverty, we need to ensure that cities are resilient. And one of the things we need to do in order to, um, to make sure they stay resilient in the future is to tackle the climate crisis. Otherwise, we're just going to have to upgrade everything again and again and again over the next few centuries. Um, and one of the targets within SDG 11, Sustainable Cities, talks about enabling developing nations to build more things 
out of locally sourced materials, which is in an effort to tackle the climate crisis. So again, you can see there's lots of sort of interplay between these goals. Um, so you've got these 17 really interrelated overlapping goals, covers a huge range of topics, and can be ridiculously confusing the first time you look at it. Um, so I find it easier to try and group them because I like to do things with fat pens rather than thin pens. And the way I group them to help me think about it is like this. There's lots of other ways that people have done this. I've seen all kind of diagrams with seesaws and stuff like that. Um, on the top left, I stick the goals that I think impact people's lives directly, um, bring people out of poverty, keep them healthy, well-fed, etc. Um, on the top right, you've got the goals that focus on creating a society that people want to live in. Uh, so one run by transparency institutions, um, where inequality is a thing of the past. At the bottom, you've then on the left got the goals that deal with the, trying to undo the, uh, the impact that's been done to this planet over the last 100, 150 years. And in the bottom right, you've got these sort of built environment goals that try and tackle um, what we're doing now to reduce the amount of impact we have in the future as we go forward. Um, and then finally, in the middle of it all, you've got SDG 17, uh, which is a sort of, you know, binds everything else together. This is all about collaboration. This is like SDG inception. I think this goal is entitled Partnership with the Goals. So this is about, you know, if we work closely with architects and quantity surveyors and the MEP engineers and help them achieve the goals that they've set out, then everyone's impact should be larger than if we all sort of work in individual silos. And to me, those goals at the top are the ones where we will probably have most sort of local impact in our work by creating a society around us that's fair and people are okay in it. And the goals at the bottom reach much further uh, and their impacts are felt by the entire planet. So whilst I am gonna to touch on diversity and poverty and things like that this evening, I'm mostly gonna focus on these global impact goals at the bottom, if that's okay with people. Yeah, good, okay, cool. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you said yes because I don't have a second set of slides for if you said no. <laughs> So um, before we dive into any of these goals, we need to remind ourselves as to why these global impact goals are important. Um, and there's three things to reiterate on this topic that I'm sure you've all seen a lot about recently. So number one, there is a problem, and people are starting to agree this is quite a big deal. Um, you don't have to be a sustainability expert to see that people are starting to talk about this more and more. There were four million children um, striking last Friday in the hope that you know, grown-ups will do something about this. Climate change has had a rebranding. It's now the climate emergency, and people are starting to agree maybe we should step up our game a bit. Um, a reminder of the science for people who didn't pay attention in geography or history, I guess, maybe, science. Um, you know, the earth beneath us is full of carbon. We spent the last 150 years digging it up, putting it into the atmosphere. This planet's amazing. It's full of plants uh, in the sea and on the land that absorb it, but we don't have enough plants to keep up with what we're putting up there. So over the last century or so, the amount of carbon in the atmosphere has gone up and up, and with it, temperature levels have risen. And we're currently at about one degree warmer than we were pre-industrialization levels. So in terms of what that means, in terms of what this global warming means, there's books like this that give a fantastic overview. And by fantastic, I guess I mean horrifying. Um, this, so this book by Davis Wallace Wells summarizes the sort of current understanding of scientists around the world. There's about 700 or so references in here. Um, and the summary is that if we don't do anything, by the end of this century, and potentially none of us will be alive by the end of the century, but all of our kids will be, by the end of this century, there'll be four or five degrees temperature rise versus pre-industrialized levels. And that doesn't just mean we'll be a bit warmer in winter. That means that uh, the south of Europe will be in permanent drought. It means that uh, flooding damage in the UK will be about 60 times as bad as it is today. And it means that there will be potentially a global food deficit where the world, like you know, the planet, can't produce enough calories to sustain the number of people who live on it. Um, so this is all pretty dramatic stuff, and it's not a far off future. These are predictions happening within our lifetime and the lifetimes of our kids. So movements like such engineers declare, architects declare, and the like, have all started to happen recently as people have started to wake up to this maybe being something we should do something about. Um, and whilst these declare movements are great, um, because you know we're asking people like the UN and our government to do something about this, I think most of us are here tonight because we're thinking how can we personally do something about this in our work 
not rather than just waiting for somebody else to impose some new laws on us or something. Um, on the Structural Engineers Clare movement, this is a list as of Friday, of all the firms that had signed up to that movement. Please have a quick look to see if your firm's on there. And if it's not, feel free to ignore me for the next 30 seconds, email your boss and ask him or her why you haven't signed up to this. Um, if your name does appear on here, then you can take these 30 seconds to reflect on what you should now be doing with your jobs, which includes raising awareness of the urgent need for change, advocating for faster industry change, including carbon counting in everything we do, everything, uh, choosing reuse over new builds wherever possible, and minimising waste. And presumably you've all been doing that all day, so I don't need to say any more about any of those topics. Um, but maybe there is still a bit of room for improvement here and there. Um, it's also worth looking at the Architects and Clare website because most of our collaborators and clients have probably signed up to this. And if you go on there and you look at what they've pledged to do, the next time you want to make the argument for a nice, deep, sustainably sourced beam, sorry, sustainably sized beam, you can remind them of what they're supposed to be doing. And you can say, well, look, look, this is far more efficient. Aren't you meant to be caring about efficiency now? So that's worth a quick look as well. It's pretty similar to the Engineers for Clare site. So if we do nothing, four to five degrees C global warming, that sounds bad. So what targets have been set? So a couple of really important things have happened in about the past year. Uh, number one was that scientists at the IPCC reached agreement that global warming beyond about one and a half degrees, and remember we're already at one, so beyond one and a half will be extreme and hard to control. And they made this statement, which is the only way we're going to you know, make sure we stick within one and a half degrees, as if rapid far-reaching and unprecedented changes happen, which all sounds pretty scary, right? Off the back of this, the UK government has announced that this country will be net carbon neutral by the year 2050, and there are now people talking about whether this could happen sooner. But whether it's 2050, 2040, whatever, the point of this is that regardless of whether people believe the science or not and believe whether this is human-induced or not, this is just going to become law. So carbon counting, energy reporting, caring about the environment will just become law. We'll have to do it regardless. So it becomes a bit futile making, trying to make an argument as to whether this is due to the sun heating up or us pumping carbon into the atmosphere. So number one, the, we agree there's a problem. We don't like the sound of what will happen if this continues to get worse, and we now have some limits we need to aim for. Number two, it's worth knowing that structural engineers actually have quite a lot of power to do something about this. You might have seen this number before. Um, nearly 40% of global energy-related carbon emissions come from buildings and construction. So this industry is bloody massive, right? Off the back of that, years and years ago, in-use energy used to be the main bulk of the problem. But nowadays, the balance has shifted as our MEP mates have been using more and more sustainable designs. Um, and embodied carbon is now the primary contributor, or will soon become the primary contributor, to the whole life carbon footprint of a building. And what makes up most of the embodied energy? It's us, sat in this room. So most of this is substructure, superstructure, and relevant construction emissions. So we are the biggest bit of the biggest bit of a very big bit of a really big problem. Um, and it's amazing we don't have, you know, the Extinction Rebellion or whoever camped outside demanding we do something about this. Th this is fantastic. This is brilliant. Because this means we can make a really big difference with our work and enact a change that's far bigger than what our friends are going to enact by taking a reusable cup to Starbucks. This is great. This is a big opportunity for us. And this is a good time to be talking about it. So right now, sustainability is really sexy. It's sexy enough to convince people to change their diet, to reduce the amount of air travel they take. Like I say, to take their own mug out with them when they go to get a coffee in the morning. But for perspective, skipping that cross-Atlantic flight is going to save one ton of carbon. Sounds kind of big. One ton. If you cut meat, dairy, and I hate to say it, but beer out of your diet for an entire year, that's two tons. And if you somehow manage to convince your family to ditch the car and walk everywhere for the next year, that's maybe something like three tons, um, unless you have a Prius or whatever, I guess. For comparison, a new housing development or maybe a new skyscraper in the middle of a city is going to be somewhere in the region of 10,000 to 100,000 tons of carbon. Google's new headquarters here in London has got something like 25,000 cubic metres of concrete going into it, which is, uh, and 12,000 tons of steel, which gives you something like 30,000 tons of carbon. 
Um, the cheese grater is another 20,000 tonnes. Right at the upper end of the scale, if you look at the Burj Khalifa, by my back of envelope calculated on the train on the way down this afternoon, I reckon you're looking at about a quarter of a million tonnes of carbon in the structure alone. Um, I'm not giving these numbers to make judgments. These buildings have all been designed by world-class engineers and are probably pretty efficient. The point I'm making is that the numbers we're dealing with in our industry are astronomical compared to these other numbers. Um, if you look at how much building space you designed last year, um, you know, you take the projects you and your team have worked on, add it up, divide it by the number of people on the team, you might come up with, I don't know, something like 5,000 square metres per year, more or less, for example. Um, an average carbon footprint for a structure might be in the realms of 200 kilos per square metre. So that means per year you're responsible for about 1,000 tonnes. That's a pretty big responsibility, right? That means that if you can do things 20% better, you save 200 tonnes of carbon. And that's quite a big difference. So if there's only one thing you take away with you and you tell other people about after this evening, it's this. The, tr the um, effects we can have with our professional choices are just orders of magnitude bigger than what we can have with our personal choices. Um, and I don't think everyone in this industry realises this, and I don't think most of our clients do either. Um, our clients are really good people. They, you know, they generally want to do good things. They probably will take their own mug to Starbucks. But I think if they knew about this, there might be other ways we have conversations with them going forwards. Um, obviously, by the way, do both, not just one or the other, right? Ex except the beer thing, you know. It's <laughs> so there's a problem. We can do a lot about it. But number three, we need to do things really differently. And that's the radical, unprecedented change bit. And so now that we agree the magnitude of this responsibility we have, let's head back to the SDGs to talk about how we can do this. Um, and clearly it goes without saying that these are all things we should be doing, whether the SDGs exist or not. It's just quite a nice framework to talk about things in. It helps us communicate with people outside of our industry. And it gives us a sort of, you know, boxes to put ideas into as we focus on them. Um, so let's go back to these global impact goals with the ultimate goal of trying to hit that one and a half degree limit set by the IPCC. This report, which was published by C40 and Arup earlier this year, um, was written by a bunch of people who tried to do exactly that. They said, what do we have to do in the C40 cities of the world if we're going to hit one and a half degrees C or less? So they've done all the hard work for us. I and mean, you can find this, by the way, if you just Google C40 urban consumption. Um, they worked out what we have to do. They put this one snazzy little table in on about page 70 somewhere in amongst everything else. And I'm not going to read it all out, but a couple of the highlights are that it states that by 2030, we need to reduce our cement usage by 56%. We need to build 90% of all new residential products at timber. And we need to ensure that 20% of all building projects, just 20% of all of them, become reuse refurb projects rather than new builds. So this is your dramatic, unprecedented IPCC change. Um, and you can see that they mostly fit into a handful of SDGs. Um, so if we just do all that, you know, easy, right? Um, they're pretty ambitious. I don't think any of this is new. Uh, the kids in my wife's school basically came up with the same concept when put together for now. We just need to apply it to the building industry instead of, you know, cartons of milk and stuff. Um, so my interpretation of that table and that green poster looks a bit like this where plan A going forward just needs to be that we build less stuff. Plan B, if plan A fails, is you reuse whatever you've already got in some form or another. And plan C, if you absolutely must build something new from scratch, you do it efficiently with low carbon materials. And whilst I've stuck an SDG 12 sticker on here, you know, this is gonna be a mixture of SDGs 9, 11, and 12, which is industry and innovation, sustainable cities, and responsible consumption. So it's just three SDGs. Um, so let's go through each of them briefly. So plan A, build less stuff. That C40 report I mentioned, it said one in five building projects need to become reuse. Um, I can't show you an image of this, which is a shame because it's brilliant. Um, but this is a project that Arup were working on that's currently in planning, where the client basically said, show me a reused version of this project while I reuse the 30-story tower currently on the site and show me a new build project and tell me the differences. And we were able to explain that it would have half the impact if they picked the reuse project, um, the reuse option. And they went with it, you know, not just because of the story that this tells, but in part because of the story that this tells. They see that that adds value to their projects and they get excited about it and they think they can sell that to people who are going to less office space from them. They do like this stuff. Um, 
So that sounds great when a client's asked for it, but what can you do in your work tomorrow if they're not asking for it? Um, I'm going to put up a few of these grey slides, and it's basically a bunch of ideas that me and other people in my team have come up with over the past couple of weeks, trying to give you a start of 10, so I should give them some credit as well. But it, this is by no means exhaustive, and it's just the ideas of a few engineers. Um, number one, I think, is just start looking at reuse when you can. Right? So if you've got a competition entry, treat it as an opportunity to maybe consider what you could do that the client hasn't thought of. Could you keep the basements, even if you are going to demolish the superstructure? Could you keep the foundations, even if you are going to demolish the basement? Um, show it to them, do the carbon calcs on it, and explain to them what the difference is in terms of you know, number of forests that are effectively cutting down. Um, and then talk about the benefits of it with the building owner. Explain to them how in 10, 15 years' time, you know, it's going to be the norm that a building has been designed sustainably. And so if they're still, you know, knocking things down and building things from scratch, they're going to look like dinosaurs. Um, talk about it with them. Just be honest with them. Um, by the way, how many people in this room feel comfortable doing a back of envelope carbon calc on a structure? Yeah. Okay, so for people online, there's about four hands in the air. And there's way more than four people at this lecture in this room. <laughs> um, so it looks a bit like this, and it's really easy. Um, after this talk, one of the links I'm going to put up is to a thing called the ICE database, which is basically a bunch of numbers that have been assembled by people at a company called Circular Ecology and um, Bath University, where basically for each building material, they've said there's this many kilos of carbon for that many kilos of C30 concrete, this many kilos of carbon for that many kilos of... CLT timber. They're UK specific, but there are similar databases out there for other countries around the world. You can get hold of them. I used to just write these down on a post-it note on my desk that just said concrete, rebar, steel, brick, timber. And that's kind of all you really need. You only really need four or five numbers. And then you can do this stuff really quickly. And you can say, well, option B looks to be 30% lower carbon than option A. We're not quite sure the numbers, so it could be 10%, it could be 50%, but we think it's probably the right thing to do. Um, and I think we're all in agreement, at least within my team, that we need to do this more often and just get better at it because we, we don't do it often enough. We sit there and work out what's cheaper for our clients because we know how much steel costs per ton, but we don't always work this out straight away, so we should. Real easy. Um, then reuse in the future. Let's assume that you do have to build something today that's new or whatever. Thinking forward to enabling people to reuse stuff later on. Um, I think we can maximise the chances of that by creating you know, beautiful, holistically designed, but most importantly, well-detailed structures that won't just last 50 years, they'll last 150 years. You know, timber that's not rotting and steel that's not rusting will give you the, the best chance of keeping it up there. Um, having sensible spans, grids, opening sizes that will help future flexibility means that hopefully your structure will stay through the rest of your lifetime. Um, and keeping good records is obviously key. People who have worked on existing building jobs know that the worst bit is usually trying to work out what was built in the first place. So if you're only going to write three things down, I'd suggest it's probably where the rebar is, what the material is that you made it out of, and what the loading assumptions were in the first place. And that'll just make everyone's life easier. So plan A, keep it if you can keep it. Don't knock it down and build something new. Plan B, if you do have to build something new, how can we re uh, enable the reuse of components when we do build that new thing? So that C40 table talks about, again, one in five building components getting reused on top of the one in five refer projects. Um, this, this idea is what people have been referred to as the circular economy for a while, for people who haven't heard the term, which is the idea of keeping products just in the supply chain again and again and again. So not getting something new, using it, throwing away, but seeing if you can reuse them. And this is something we've been looking at for a few years now. We built this building outside the building center um, about three years ago. We named it the circular building, which confused a lot of people because it's square on plan. And on, even end on, it's got triangles and stuff in it. Um, but this was a prototype house built out of components and material that came straight off an existing production line, was put up for a few weeks or months, and then went straight back onto the production line and was since reused, remanufactured, and recycled. We had to work closely with like Lindapter to make little clamping connections for all of the facades. Um, we actually had to change the dimension of the building because all the steel was off cuts from the production line. They said, well, these are the links we've got. It turns out you can change dimensions of buildings because you're all fantastic engineers who can deal with changing stuff. Um, so that was fine. And after it was disassembled, the steel just went straight back to the people who gave it to us. Um, so we want to do this more. We want to do this on bigger projects. I don't think you can do design for deconstruction on everything. 
I think that's generally accepted that a lot of geometries don't work with it. But if you've got a really repetitive building anyway, like a long span roof or a big repetitive office building, um, you know, why not maximize that? You make all the grids as identical as you can. You try and use the same beam size again and again and again. Maybe you do that at the expense of a bit of efficiency for now, so that you've got 100 beams, all 10 meters long, all the same size. It becomes a bit more like a shopping list of beams to sell in 100 years' time. Um, think about the connections. So we're not using composite stuff. We don't like welds and glue and shear studs, but we like bolts and we like screws so we can undo stuff. Um, and then again, keep good records. And people, I haven't yet seen anyone do this, but I guess the idea would be you write some kind of deconstruction plan and you put it in the O&M manual that just says undo this bit first, then this bit. Don't weld this up if you want to add some capacity to that. That sort of thing. That sounds really simple, right? Okay, and then plan C, absolute last option. If everything else fails, if you really have to knock it down and you can't save any of it because it's crap and you have to build something new from scratch, we need to get better at doing this more efficiently. So there's research that shows that we are making incredibly inefficient structures. And whether you believe the 50% figure or not, I think we can probably all agree there's a bit of fat in our designs from time to time. Um, or at least, you know, the, the design of the engineer sat next to me. Obviously, my design would never be that bad, etc. But we all know there's extra material out there um, because there are incentives to keep it in, right? Buildability, uh, the architect's going to change something at the last minute. What if they build it a bit wrong? All of that. We need to start convincing our colleagues to change their minds on this. Um, people would like to have the safety blanket of a bit of spare capacity in there, but that's what things like load factors are for, right? If you got the maximum load out of the code and you put a load factor on top of it, that's as much load as your structure should ever see. So there's no real reason not to design that to 100% on the dot. So to be delivering CD with like 90% capacity is just a bit silly, really. On top of that, with codified loads, there are some people now suggesting that maybe even what's in the code is you know completely unrealistic. So 5 kPa, you all have to get into the corner of the room, put your hands in the air and stand next to each other. And people are designing offices for this. 5 kPa plus an extra 50%, which is your ULS factor safety. You've got to physically take people and put them on top of those people who've got their arms in the air. It's just, I mean, it's not going to happen, is it? It's insane. Um, so at the very least, we should be aiming to design for 100% of this. Definitely, you know, no spare capacity, and arguably maybe less. Um, and the work of people like Micon is doing really good things at questioning this, and I hope this is going to change things as we go forward. Um, you know, better still, obviously we should be designing the, the structure efficient, efficiently once we've got this layout set, but even better would be to agree earlier on with the architects that we're going to set an ambitious target and we're going to arrange the structure in a nice, efficient way. Because if all of that embodied energy in the building mostly comes from the structure, it would probably make sense to let the structure dictate where things go a bit more readily. So we won the competition to design this tower in Taipei, which has got some of the highest seismic and typhoon loads in the world, because we basically said to the architect and the client, we reckon we can do that for two thirds of the steel of this number that you're quoting as being sort of typical. And the architects loved this idea, they went with it. They said, how do we do that? What, what does the arrangement of the tower look like? And so this is a structure or a building site that's entirely driven by structural efficiency. And as, as a result, we might've saved something like 40,000 tons of carbon or something. There's probably you know 50 or 60,000 tons of carbon in the structure but that could have been 100. Um, so these are the sort of numbers we want to be doing. I think it's fair to say that my boss, who convinced the architect to go with this, smashed his 200-ton figure out of the park that year and could probably go home and eat all the red meat he wanted for Christmas. <laughs> um, so efficient design, early collaboration, sitting down with the architect, saying, hey, you signed up to that website, didn't you, to declare one? Yeah, I've got some ideas. Um, you know, Agree that with them and then remind them of it as you go through the design process. Calculate the embodied carbon as we go along. Have a go at it tomorrow, it's really easy. Um, and then finally, try and find some time to optimize the design. People outside of our industry think it's nuts that we get to the end of the CD, we rush it and get it out the door, and we don't go back at it and try and see if we could trim some more material out of it. Um, maybe consider asking the client to pay you to do it for a month on the basis you'll probably save them more money than it will cost them to let you do it. Um, a word of warning, I was asked to say by people who do expert witness type work, uh, they all tell me that they see too many buildings that are only stood up because they've got that fat still in it. So if you are going to do that extra bit of optimization, maybe do a bit of extra checking 
at the same time, just to, you know, to get it right as well as efficient. But then as well as efficiency in terms of the amount of material, let's start questioning the material in the first place. This is a pretty extreme example, and I'm not suggesting you should all start building skyscrapers out of mud blocks. But when we did this project in Rwanda, we created a million earth blocks out of soil that we literally dug up off the ground just behind this photo. Um, and we created about 17,000 square metres of education space. This had a um, carbon footprint for the total thing, including the fired bricks, sorry, fired tiles on the roof and the glass in the windows, of about 200 kilos of carbon per square metre, which is less than half of what a typical education project here in the UK would have and is in the sort of realms of what you'd expect the structure alone to be. So this was, this was a pretty cool thing to have done. Um, I'm not suggesting you can use earth bricks everywhere, but sustainably sourced timber uh, is pretty damn available now, I'd say. Um, and there's little reason why we should be building residential projects out of anything other than CLT, to be completely honest. And, you know, the roofs of most buildings should probably be timber as well whilst we're at it. Um, this should be sustainably sourced, let's be clear, but that's pretty easy to get hold of, at least in the UK. Uh, other things on materials, presumably you're all using recycled aggregate and cement replacements in all of your mixes, um, but we should be keeping an eye out for things like SEM3 and stuff as they develop and we get closer and closer to 100% cement replacement concretes, because until we do something about concrete, we're still going to be sort of chasing our tail a bit. Um, and we should take the liberty to make demands of our supply chain, why not? you got tenderers, uh, contractors tendering for a project. Why not put in the questionnaire questions about where are your materials going to come from? What's the embodied carbon in your concrete? Ask them for the environmental product declarations. Just make them do extra work. It's fine. They do all this stuff for free at the start, don't they? And then you can hold them to it later on, um, which is great. Uh, warning on this one is the timber thing, and this is a bugbear of mine, as some of you know. Timber is not some magical carbon negative or carbon neutral material that you can just you know, frivolously throw at everything. It does have a net carbon emission into the atmosphere by the time you've taken down the building and burnt it for energy or put it into landfill. And the environmental product declarations of all the manufacturers agree with that. But having said that, that number is usually low enough that if you use it properly in the right buildings, so things like cellular resi buildings, uh, things like hotels, stuff like that, it usually comes out as a better option. Um, the good news is you don't have to take my word for it, you can just do the carbon calc, right? Because you can, you wrote down those numbers I put on the screen before, so you can go away and have a go. Um, but yeah, the point is, you know, quantifiably we need to check things rather than just assuming. So we're going to prioritise refurbishment, we're going to reuse bits of existing structure, uh, we're going to design it so they can take it down in the future and reuse it, and we're going to sharpen our pencils, configure things properly, use low carbon materials, all good stuff. Um, whilst we're doing all of that, I also think, you know, SDG 17 is the most important next thing we could be doing, right? So this is about partnering with our collaborators so that they can design buildings that are accessible, uh, buildings that use clean water and clean energy and all these good things. But it's also about, uh, for those of us who do overseas projects, helping to knowledge share with the people we work in, work with in other countries, because this country's actually got a really small carbon footprint when you compare it to the rest of the world. It's like 1% of global carbon emissions from the UK or something. You might think that that's insignificant, therefore there's no point in doing this. But we're basically like the R&D hothouse for the rest of the world, right? So we might as well figure out how to do this stuff. And then next time you build a project in India and you're speaking to the local engineers, you say, hey, have you heard about this 200 ton thing that Will Arnold mentioned? And they go, no, probably not. Um, but you know, we can help other people learn from this. And then our impacts get bigger and bigger. So this is one of my favourite projects that I wish that I was able to have worked on. Uh, this was in Bangladesh, and you probably heard of the Rana Plaza disaster in 2013, um, which killed about 1,200 people when it just collapsed. Uh, we were asked if we would design and um, sort of write in a, a structural safety assessment methodology for all of the other buildings in Bangladesh um, that made ready what do you call it, ready-to-wear garments or whatever. Um, and we wrote the methodology. We went out to Bangladesh and we inspected about 800 or so factories, which was great. More importantly, we trained up local engineers in Bangladesh on how to use this methodology, which meant they could then go out and assess another 3,000 factories on top of that. So the impact that those people had who had written the methodology all of a sudden got something like quadrupled 
off the back of sharing that knowledge and hopefully will have changed the way that you know those engineers out there consider building design in the future which will have further and further impacts um, so that's good so that's that's the longest bit of this tour you'll be pleased to know but the global impact goals i argue are the the biggest and most important thing we should be thinking about right now um, on our projects we're going to target future flexibility design for deconstruction all these things all whilst counting and tracking carbon and then we're going to knowledge share if we're doing this abroad right no point in doing any of that if it's going to come at the expense of people's equality the fairness of people's work and their health right and that's where the local impact sdgs come in so i'm just going to take the last sort of four or five minutes to look at these and how they feed into that bigger picture so if the global impact goals are the sort of uh, i guess where the output of our work has impact then the local impact goals i think are where the way that we work has impact so many people think the goals one to four in the top left which are around poverty hunger health and education aren't really applicable to the so-called western world um, but we're all quite used to seeing headlines like this so we probably all agree that there's work to be done on most of these goals um, we need to ask ourselves if we are really comfortable working for developers who are going to knock down entire communities of people's houses who have been in you know parts of cities for generations and ask them to go and live somewhere else maybe we should open our fee proposal letters by saying yeah we'd absolutely love to do the work for you we're going to put in a very good fee and we're going to use timber obviously um, but only if the new developments include space for those communities maybe it's easier to say this than to do it because i'm not in charge of anyone's you know jobs but we should and we all know that we should morally um, similarly is it okay to be undertaking work in parts of the world where people are going to die realizing the structures you designed probably not and should we require our young engineers to be raising 2200 pounds from their friends in order to go overseas disseminate that knowledge that they've learned and make differences to the most the least resilient communities in the world you know what could our firms the people who employ us what could they do more to support people like this this it this is actually discrimination because if tilly didn't have friends who could cobble together two thousand pounds she wouldn't have done this so if you're from certain backgrounds you just don't consider doing ewb um, so we should be asking more of our employers to do more of this kind of stuff and we also have a responsibility to speak up against you know acts of discrimination whether that's gender race sexuality this industry is still imbalanced uh, in terms of the male female split and the construction sector i believe has the worst gender balance of any sector in the uk um, and so no matter how hard people try to make you know positive choices you still have things like unconscious bias which is going to lead to you know natural sexism continuing to occur in this industry earlier in this year there was a letter published uh, that somebody had written in that was sexist and it caused uproar quite rightly so um, and i you know you can't help but wondering if the colleagues of the person who wrote that letter in had spoken to him more often and called him out for making sexist comments at work whether that would have been written in the first place hopefully not that is our responsibility and no one else's ultimately to tackle things like this and we can do it at the same time as doing all of that 200 tons of carbon stuff because that's the easy bit right um so what have we been doing at arup because i said i'll share some examples so we revamped our work experience program entirely recently we now offer i think it's about two-thirds of all of our work experience places go to kids who come in from social mobility foundation other charities in the area and local schools and we only save the other third for people who come in through sort of employee referral um, which is basically just about encouraging people into engineering like a grassroots level regardless of their background because ultimately arup would like to pick the best engineers out of 100 percent of the population and not 50. Um, so we thought that'd be a good thing to do we've also set up this inclusion diary room which i really like which is basically an internal email address that you can send your uh, views to whenever you've experienced inclusion or exclusion in the workplace and they then publish these anonymous things on an internal website which is good for those of us who don't get to experience these issues on a day-to-day -day basis so there's a lot of us who probably think actually this isn't really a problem in my workplace i'm surrounded by great people i don't see any of this happen i quite like this because it it serves as a nice bit of a reminder that there's still work to do um, and there's lots of positive stories come out of this as well so that was that was good so in addition to your global impact goals and your 200 tons of carbon and all that we can take a few 
fairly significant steps to align ourselves with these local impact goals as well. Type of work that we turn down is maybe important. Positive work that strengthens the communities, positive work that gives builders a safe environment to work in. That's all good. We should be more supportive, I believe, in terms of people who want to dedicate their time to community engagement projects. Um, and ultimately, regardless of the project and how we're going to go about doing it, we should be trying to assemble strong, diverse teams around us and giving up other people the opportunities that we have been quite lucky to receive so far in our lives. So that's it. Um, really quick three slide recap, because I'm going to remind you of three things. So my talk uh, was entitled The Targeted Approach to the UN SDGs, and hopefully you'll maybe agree with me that there are a few SDGs that we can have a really big impact on and some other sort of supporting roles. Um, and so my three points, number one is about picking your SDGs at the start of a project. So we have a process in our now where we try to assess our projects against the different SDGs and identify two or three goals where we could really maximize our impact. So maybe it's going to be pushing an agenda for reuse with the client because you think they've missed something. Maybe you're designing for deconstruction or maybe you're just going to optimize the hell out of the really weird shaped buildings that the architect gave you. But you're going to pick it and then you're going to push it to its limit and make the biggest impact you can with that one goal. That's idea number one. Idea number two is really easy. Um, count carbon in everything we do uh, because ultimately if we don't reduce the amount of carbon in the atmosphere, we're going to get stuck on everything else we're doing. Um, Go to circularecology.com, download these numbers and have a go, or give it to the grad who works for you and get them to have a go, and then learn. It's really easy. Um, and then number three, and the most important one, if you're only going to do one thing, it's remember that impact that you're having through your work and this order of magnitude difference between personal life and professional life. Talk to other people about it. Talk to your clients about it, your architects about it. Um, Remind them that they're doing great things already by going vegan, but they could do even greater things if they make the right decisions at work. Thank you for your time.